back. Welcome back to Open Your Eyes. We're moving now into our first segment. And this one is going to be a conversation with reps from the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry. As a matter of fact, in with us this morning is Marcelo Bleak. He is the Vice President of the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And also uh, Dion Elliott, who is the Chief Policy Analyst at BCCI. Gentlemen, a very pleasant morning. Good morning. Good morning, Marlene. Good morning, John. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good morning. It's always nice to have you guys in. I think uh, we're at the right, right point to make some discussions, but primarily for me, I'd like to uh, firstly point out that a few days ago, uh, the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, issued a, their press release uh, with respect to um, what the unions and GOB are going through and uh, was adamant about, you know what, you guys need to get back to the table. So primarily, let's break down the press release so people could understand uh, what, it's, what it's talking about and then we move on from there. Marcelo? All right. Thanks, John. Um, well, thanks again. We, um, our press release really is geared towards trying to help the process along, um, getting everybody back at the table uh, for the discussion to continue. Um, our, our goal here in that entire process is to be able to <clears throat> um, let level heads um, enter the room uh, because it's very politically and emotionally uh, driven at this time, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the only persons that can benefit are the people and the country as a whole. As we've, we've stated in that press release, and if I could just share one short paragraph from it, it says, as we start, stated earlier this year, and we had done a press release back in February after the budget consultation, uh, while the economy may need the preservation of as much spending power as possible to help the speedy recovery. At the same time, it must also acknowledge that Belize's fiscal space is especially constrained. These are inescapable realities, the solution to which cannot be found if negotiations break down. And so at the end of the day, we want to make sure that uh, the conversations continue and that in fact there can be some kind of resolution, solution, or meeting of the minds on some of those critical areas that will help us to, as a country, rebound and move forward. Uh, none of us planned for COVID. And so with the impact of COVID coupled with what has been uh, spending, this, uh, going back many, many years, different administrations where we have been spending to the extent that we are beyond um, where we should be as a country. I mean, 133% um, of GDP debt is, is, is significant. Um, bringing that home to uh, the regular household, it just means that you are 33% extended beyond what it is that you earn, that you can actually spend, which means that you are constantly borrowing. And at some point, that that's going to tap out because we all know if we are in this and we as an individual we're going to the bank and we need extended financing we've we have a mortgage we have personal loan to send the kids to school and now we're in a position where we need additional funds for home improvements as an example we go to the bank the bank will look at our finances and see what's your income what are all your expenses, utilities, you know, food bill, all of that, and then determine whether or not we are viable for extended credit. If it is that we are beyond a certain level of extension, then we become a risk, which then means they will possibly lend us, but they'll lend us at a much higher rate. And in the case of where they decide not to lend us, then where do we turn to? And we as a country are slowly getting to that point where as we look to borrow on the international market there will be persons who will say you're too risky for us to have uh to to, to uh extend any additional credit to and then there are others who would possibly lend us but the question is at what premium what would we as a people have to pay back yeah you know, I, I love that you're, you're trying to break it down to um, an example where people within their households can really understand. Um, we have heard from many different stakeholders about the gravity of 
our economic situation. Uh, I want to hear just your perspective as the private sector. You play such a critical role in, in, in keeping the economy going. And as you have noted, COVID was, you know, I've called it a, a sledgehammer of sorts to most businesses, but also where we were before that, where we'd already seen four quarters of, of, of decline. We were already, as many would say, in, in a recession. You want me to take that one, Marcelo, or? Jump in, man. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the macroeconomic situation, I think, has been basically discussed at length over the last couple of months. And, and so I don't, I don't believe there's much need to, to, to reiterate too many of those points, except to, to highlight certain things that are not frequently discussed. I, John, you, earlier you were saying you saw another program where I was on yesterday. Um, we were, the president and myself were on the Business Perspective Show, which is a show that is hosted by the Chamber of Commerce, and we talked about this as well. Where the Belizean economy is what you call a, me, a medium-high vulnerable economy. And because of the time constraints that we have this morning, when that, what that means is that you're more exposed to exogenous shocks, what we economists like to call exogenous shocks, things that happen outside of your economy's control that have a ramification on what happens to you here. And usually there are some natural environment stuff like climate change. There is the fact that we're dependent on a very narrow basket of goods and services exports, like tourism, for example, that brings in 60% of your foreign reserves. And then you have this a, a narrow export destination. Oh, yes, you guys, yes, I forgot you guys have that thing in the studio. Um, <laughs> well, for those watching by TV, then you have your, your we're reliant on strategic imports. So you're talking about your energy imports, your oil, your, your gasoline, that type of stuff. You rely on food imports. You rely on intermediate inputs as imports. And then you have social susceptibility, which, as you're seeing, that is measured one part in by crime, homicide rate. And, and all of these things make you a vulnerable economy. So that when the CDC headquarters in the United States says that there is a no-sale order on cruise lines, none of them comes to your shore and you end up with massive unemployment in the cruise sector. Mm -hmm. When you have to close your airport, you have basically no tourists coming for a long period of time and then you have a trickle coming back. And every so often the U.S. government goes and issue an advisory that kind of messes things up. So... And there, well, since you guys are showing the graph, there is a graph, page three of it, uh, or slide three of it, there is a graph that I had put together. And I won't get into the technicalities here, but what this does is plots Belize's, or countries, this is either five countries' vulnerability, next to the speed of forecasted recovery that the IMF has forecasted for countries. Traditionally, vulnerability theory says, that theory, actually it's been studied over the years, that the more vulnerable the economy is, you tend to go slower because international world market prices affect you, natural disasters affect you, X, Y, Z. Those same vulnerabilities are pulling down the speed at which we could recover. That, all I will say here is you look at that downward line that talks, that's a downward trend. So basically, the higher vulnerability you have relatively expect, and all things being equal, a slower recovery. That's without any protest, that's without any COVID, that's without anything that needs to be considered. So. By definition, we're already an economy that's starting at what the vernacular would say on the bad foot. An economy is held up by businesses. Businesses are the ones that employs people. They are the ones that creates revenue. Government gets revenue from economic activity. So if your economy is down by 14% in 2020, which when you rank it in order to decline, Belize has the, the 16th steepest decline in out of 194 countries in the world. So we're in a very, very bad place. And, and one of the things that we are looking at here is that while we're in a very, very bad place, there's a line from a song that I like, I like. It says, there's a line where the guy says, show me where it hurts so I can make it worse. We don't need anything right now that should make it worse. If we talk about doing business reform, the government, this current government is rightly talking about doing business reform. But the majority of the business reform requires partnership with the, with the public sector. So if you have striking people in government that you need to go to when you have to start a business, you need to go to when you want to pay taxes, you need to go to when you want to register property, and many of the, and trading across borders, you need to go to government agencies. And if you run the risk of having go slow or any type of industrial action, you're, 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 making, you're potentially going to make an economic recovery that's already slow by nature possibly being even slower. 
And so from the business community standpoint, we're saying you get, we need to get cooler heads to return to the table. I'm happy to say that the NTUCB also put out a press release calling for the same thing, saying that we need to get back to the negotiating table. Because from but a that, business standpoint, that's going to be harsh. And that's, that's one of the things I wanted to get a reaction on, just uh, the recent news. When you, you're quoting NTUCB, Meanwhile, we have the Public Service Union saying that they feel that there is no more consultation to be held. They've also announced well, that they're moving into strike action on Monday. Yeah, yeah well, that's internal, that's internal to them. I don't, they, I, we, we, I don't understand the internal structures and relationships between the NTUCB, the PSU, and the BNT. No, uh, but differentiating, uh, differentiating how the NTUCB falls under the umbrella organization of the NTUCB is one thing. But from a business perspective, when you look at uh, the implications of the public service going on strike, or when you have union leaders saying, we are not going back to the table, this is really an alarming situation. Would you agree? Of course. I, I think that's kind of what I was outlining just now, that there is not, there's very few business processes that don't require businessmen and women to have to pass through a government office. Yeah. So if you have... Yeah. We, we talk efficiency requires the public sector role in this as well. Tax, you you want to talk about tax collections? It's not the ministers that are going to go out and do the tax collection that's been evaded, you know. It's going to be the same public officers, mm. right? And so in the NLD, this is not helpful. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are in, I used the analogy yesterday, we're all in one boat. And it's, sometimes it comes across as if we have to be careful that we're not digging holes. And this is true for all stakeholders. Mm. We're not digging holes into the, the boat, making this thing, the water that's coming in, coming in even faster. Yeah. Sorry, Marcel, I think we're about to say something. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying that from, from the strike action standpoint, yes. Everything that businesses do yeah. always has a link into the public uh, sector. And so it is important that we come back to the table. And that's the reason why I opened with that, because yeah. if that occurs, then it may slow business even further. Mm. We are in a position where we're struggling as a business community, trying to keep things afloat, uh, trying to ensure that business continues, ensuring that we can supply the goods and services for, um, for the end consumer. But if that slows even further, and, and apologies, but it's already slow. So yeah. if it slows further, it's a stop. Uh, then what, what happens to us as a country? It's not looking at it from a business uh, community standpoint only, but as a country, then everything stops. Mm -hmm. The other thing we don't consider is all of these actions that we're doing. Yes, we, we want to make sure that uh, there's, there's fair conversations at the table, but on, the international community is watching as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so at the end of the day, these yeah. things will have a rippling effect. And we not are today, but down the road. And we are in the midst of, of attempting to restructure the debt as well, which is a critical part in, in the recovery. Now, the, the chamber has been um, very clear. You're, you're not picking sides on this. In fact, you volunteered to be a mediator in the process. Has either side picked up on this request as yet? Not, to, not, not formally, at least, okay. um, if, if I can say it like that. One of the things that, you know, sometimes you see things in the media, it always looks like the private sector and the, and the, the unions and the busy side of fighting, but we have very cordial conversations when the cameras are off, you know. Um, I, you could, I mean, just throwing this out there, the OSH committee, while we hear a lot of things in the, the news about OSH, for example, I have been one of the representatives, the private sector representative on the OSH working committee, and I have to tell you, we have had months of meetings with member representatives from the unions on that thing and we, we work very well together um of course for some anyway when the cameras comes on for some reason it seems differently now but <laughs> <laughs> right so so informally to my knowledge you know but i can tell you there are other stakeholders i won't get into that but i can tell you just yesterday evening there are other social partner stakeholders that are looking on that are agreeing with the position for cooler heads to prevail but i can't get into the details of that as yet um, so, so there is that. Um, Marlene and John, you know, one of the things that I think we have to agree on is that what's happening to Belize right now is that everybody is looking at the same problem but from different points of views. Yeah. And there's, there's a vision over what the solution should be. And one of the analogies I like to use is in a medical field. 
in the medical field, if you go to a doctor and you're sick, you have certain symptoms, the doctor may come to you with multiple treatment options. Basically, they might put all the reasonable things on the table, and then you have to decide. And so one of the recommendations that you saw from our February letter um, was that we were saying to GOB from back then, this is a serious situation. These are all these things that are on the table. That nothing should be off the table. And it's it's go and it's needed, it's necessary for us to weigh all those options and when the numbers are in to decide which one is most beneficial and we go at that. And if at the end of the day that exercise is done and you find out that okay, the cut is inevitable, then we will not stand in your way. That is what our letter basically says. Yeah. Right? And we can get into discussions about what those prescriptions could be, but the, the fundamental point is that that's what the letter was trying to allude to. The narrative coming from the government side is, is one, and if we stick with, with medical analogies, you know, it's if you're hemorrhaging before you can get to the point of uh, whether it's uh, repairing the damage that's done, you got to stop the bleeding. Um, and with the continuous barring that takes place to be able to even meet salary payments, they're saying this is one way we don't have to bleed as much. Um, are there any immediate actions, recommendations coming out um, from the private sector, or do you also agree that uh, urgent actions must be taken to cut down on, on the extent of bar borrowing? Um, well, I don't know if Marcelo wanted to take that one first, but... <laughs> Well, you've been crunching the numbers, yeah, you yeah. know. So you start and then he <laughs> well, continues. Well, well here's, here's the thing. We do not want to come out as a chamber with a specific position. Yeah. I, 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 people who know me on the side know as I have my own personal views, but I'm here representing an organization this morning, yeah. so I will speak the organizational point of view. Our position is that there are many options that are on the table, and there are some that we're noticing that are not on the table. I'll give you one example, like just literally one example that, that has been out there. One of the, you talk using the phrase hemorrhaging. Here's the problem. Belize is an uh, economy that relies on a certain level of international reserves. Yeah. We all know ultimately that ties to our pay. The government rightfully says they can't continue printing money the way they're doing for printing government, I mean, for wages and salaries, mm -hmm. because it will leak out as imports, which increase import demand. So because of the desk that I manage at the Chamber of Commerce, which is the Governance and Trade Division, my mind went immediately from months ago, well, in trade laws that exist, there are provisions explicitly designed for times like these. There is a thing known as restriction, restrictions um, for balance of payment safeguards. With balance of payments, basically, in a nutshell, we can talk about what's happening with your reserve, if it's going down too fast, blah, blah, blah. In the WTO rules under the gut, there's an Article 18. You guys are journalists. You can always go cross-check it for me if you want. It's there. Article 18 of the gut, the General Agreement of Tariff and Trade, also gives you that provision. Ecuador used it back in 2015 to 2017 when their monthly import cover was all the way down below two months. Belize is still about three. As a matter of fact, we're about 5.3, according to the Central Bank, and IMF says you're at 4.3. IMF under the baseline scenario says that you won't have a problem until 2024, but it's still a crisis brewing. So there is one option that I have not heard officially that is on the table, which is a simple, simple, it's not simple. Um, it's an Article 18 provision activation that would do several things. You are allowed now under WTO rules to implement a certain import surcharge on non-essential imports to help you do two things simultaneously, increase government revenue, at the same time reducing import demand if you if you, if you if you do it right. Administration-wise, there's gonna be a concern. Again, another reason why we need the public officers to be on the same page, because right, if, we're, if we're not even at the table, we can't even discuss these options, all right? And so what I'm saying, and that's just one example that should be on the table that we haven't heard being placed on the table. Okay. And, and, and clearly, I, I, if I, I, I quoted Ecuador just now. When Ecuador used this back in 2015 to 2017, they raised 1.5, over 1.5 US billion dollars on this particular measure. Wow. The, the IMF knows about it because, and interestingly, they come to us and they will recommend increasing GST, increasing excise, lowering income taxes, but they never ever mention this particular provision. Even though if you read the understanding on this particular provision, the IMF is an integral part of this process, so they are aware. Yeah. But in a, in a world where the, the religion is about trade liberalization and whatever, you, they will never tell that to you directly. So it's up to you to now think beyond what is being advised to you out of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. You have to, because now at the same time, we have a debt crisis brewing. And Chris Coy, Minister Chris Coy, 
Um, to his credit, he's also joined the Carry On Calling, calling for debt relief, which I think you guys have discussed before in the show, so there's no point in raising that here. So all I'm seeing is cuts off the table. Of course not. No. I, I, are, are, are revenue enhancement measures on the table? They can't, they can't be taken off. Mm -hmm. But we have to be able to get the, the, the technocrats and everybody in the room with cool heads to crunch the numbers and see which one will lead to the most benefit and which one can be discarded. Mm -hmm. And that cannot happen in this type of environment where people obviously are shouting over each other as opposed to talking to each other. Yeah, you know, I, I, I must say that uh, as, as you outlined that, I, I can agree that this has been a message coming out from the private sector for quite a while. Your past president, um, in fact, I think had noted uh, this as a possible solution. Uh, it was worded differently. It wasn't looking at just uh, taxes on imports, but ensuring that local players had uh, more access to the market than all the things that we are importing. But we have an example to go off. When, when the conversation started with a particular brand of milk, the, the country went in an uproar over it. And it, it, is, it goes to the, the core of uh, what is the issue here. There, is, um, there are tough decisions to be made, but then there's also uh, dealing with or preparing for the public reaction and sentiment. What are your thoughts? comes back to the, the balance of payment conversation that Dion um, mentioned earlier, which is, so if you're not able to find the foreign currency for those imports, the question is, what do you start to limit? And, and that was one action of trying to steer the local consumption back to local production and uh, pushing for uh, industry and agri to be more at the forefront, which we've seen uh, since the pandemic and the, the borders being closed. Yeah increase uh, quite significantly compared to what it was pre pre COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to yeah, understand. Yeah. yeah, you have to understand, guys, that this is I don't know if I should wear you know what? It's the facts. I shouldn't have any Kevin. hesitation in saying the facts. Basically, don't hesitate. What, Open basically, or right. what, basically what we're doing, look at what the international structures of our economy is doing. This is not a Belizean problem. The other developing countries are facing this as well. We are forced to choose between preserving our international reserve levels because we have a peg and choose between that whether or not we grow faster or we or we keep our, our very slow meager growth mm -hmm. now we talk growth and we talk gdp but behind gdp that's people mm -hmm. that's another family as minister Curdell head was saying that's another that's another family member who have to question how you feed the family that's another employer who has to sit down and numbers crunch you think, oh my God, how I keep the legs on tomorrow? Okay. That's another rent that can't be paid. That's another mortgage that's on the line of, of, of worrying about what's going to happen in the future. There's people behind these numbers. And sometimes I feel that the, the, the economic field, we get so bogged down into numbers that we forget that this is a social science about people at the end of the day. And so if you're having to choose between growing your economy at a certain speed, or between we have to find a way there have to be other options out there i just gave you one mm -hmm. i am and that's from a trade perspective you have monetary economists you have financial economists you have trade economists you have different branches of economists these people need to be thrown into a room lock the door i don't want i want to give an eye for the whole weekend and i don't want to come out until i not come with something but make sure that i am not causing my people to go hungry while at the same time still protecting what i need to protect mm -hmm. and, I, and i and i am saying that kind of tongue and cheek because of time constraints. But what I, I'm, I'm trying to get to here is that there are options that need to be on the table to, for us to trash them out and run the numbers. Yeah. You know, you said something, I think, which is the core of the matter. When we talk about these issues, we are talking about the impact on, on families. Um, let's, let's, let's proceed. And I'm not asking you to, I hear very clearly the, the chamber does not want to give a position on which side um, they, they feel is, is addressing this problem best. But for all intents and purposes, from what we've seen, debate presentations, the speak coming out of, of government, the salary cuts are going to proceed. Now, economists have said as well, there's actually going to be an immediate slowdown that happens after that. Do you want to put that into perspective? Yeah. That, that is the perspective. That is the fact. I mean, it doesn't well, matter. I mean, for the <laughs> rest of us to help understand, yeah. <laughs> once you have less money to, to, to the, spend, you buy less, yes. the businesses you, make less. How yes. does this help in the long run? It, uh, <laughs> um, in the short run, you're going to have a slowdown. 
Um, there's no two ways about that. And the only up, let me quote the IMF. See, Marcelo is the safe territory. This is the IMF. <laughs> the IMF, the IMF tells you, the IMF, the, not the United not Chamber, that if there's a document that guides on how to manage public sector wage cuts. So if you're gonna go that route, which you kind of send Mar 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 Marlene, it's kind of already in the budget. That there's a four point criteria that you want to follow. If you guys want, I can send you the link to this particular document I'm quoting afterwards. But it says that if you're going to cut, it should be progressive, meaning that low income people are less affected than upper, that, the higher income people. Mm -hmm. That it should be targeted, which means that you're carving out the frontline workers. Um, that these measures were also mentioned in our February letter, by the way, because we were kind of quoting from this from back then. It has to be temporary, and this is where a huge debate come up what temporary means if it's like the Barbados boss bun, where they gave them a boss bun and then they could claim it back eventually. Or, and then finally, to make sure that you don't drop in what economics call aggregate demand, which if you take our principles of economics course, you know that's very tied to GDP growth. To not have that fall, if you're taking the money from Peter, it seems to transfer it over to poor Paul in stimulus programs, into households, into wage subsidies, into, into unemployment relief programs, into food support, into economic stimulus for business community. Those things, the money taken over one side should be put place somewhere else. That is what the IMF guide on cutting salaries is basically telling you you should do. Because the idea there behind their thinking is that low income households have what, what we refer to in economic parlance as a higher marginal propensity to consume, meaning that low income households will spend the money as opposed to sit it in a bank and save it somewhere. And that therefore that could increase your economic demand or aggregate demand and help a little bit to speed up your, your, or, or at least not cause your economic recovery to, to slow down, but at least grow at least at that 1.92%. And if we can come out of this lucky, at least at three or four. Um, so that is the thinking from the IMF. So again, you well, can we have heard those, those, the, I mean, the tiered approach seems to have been rejected by the That's unions. Um, that well, was the 8, yeah. 10, and 12% based on income bracket. Um, Minister uh, Usher uh, outlined on Monday that, you know, it's not about saving money to spend it in another area. It's about no longer borrowing to be able to pay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not uh, holding on to money. It's not borrowing money. So, uh, you know, from any of the other four criteria, have you heard any communication coming out from our, or, um, from our government that, that fall in line with that? Those are two examples. I'm, I'm I feel like I've about. been hugging the mic, so I'll leave that to Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're worried about sharing your personal opinion. <laughs> but go ahead, Marcelo. Um, there, there's not been much that we've heard uh, coming out that uh, we could speak to. I think at the end of the day, um, we just need to make sure, as I've started out saying, that we bring the players back to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, if we're not in the same conversation, or there's no conversation, then what happens at the end of the day, everybody will suffer. Yeah. The entire uh, country and people will suffer. And I think that, that is exactly um, at this particular point, uh, because of nobody or no negotiations going on, it seems that it, that is exactly uh, where we are actually headed. Now, Marcelo, again, uh, Marlene had asked the question, so anybody picked up uh, on, 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 on these negotiations and me being mediated by the BCCI? Uh, anything from there? Nothing officially, as Dion said earlier. Um, uh, there's been conversations behind closed doors in yeah. unofficial uh, circles, but we, we wait and see. I mean, the, the release is uh, a few days old, so we will wait and see what will happen. Um, but at the same time, the Chamber continues uh, on its drive to ensure that we keep our members informed and keep the public informed as best we can. Um, I'd just like to plug in here that we have our uh, annual AGM on Thursday. Uh, it's 101st. And so, again, at that meeting, we'll be sharing um, as much information with our members. We have uh, the Prime Minister being the keynote speaker at that event. And so we are uh, optimistic that he will give us some information that we've not heard prior, uh, particularly on the economic recovery side and how we can earn additional revenues because we've we've constantly been having the conversation 
as Dion said, on the expense side and the cutting, yeah. but we've not heard a whole lot about how we will generate new revenue. Yeah. You know, looking at it from uh, the, the analogy I gave earlier of the individual, if it is that the bank tells you no, then maybe it is that you need to get a second job, a second part-time job to be able to still meet um, your, your, your expenditures. And so it's that second and third and fourth and fifth job that we need to hear about as a business community and how we can help in that exercise and foster um, the growth that is necessary for all of us to survive. Mm -hmm. if, I may add, if I may add here, because I know the time is winding down, a lot of times we get into this conversation and it's government versus somebody else yeah. type of thing. The Belizean general public have a massive role to play in all of this too, you know. Because remember, the government is faced with a balance of payment crisis because of our appetite for imports. Yeah. We, we, we can't escape that. So at some point, we need to take possibly a nationalist position and say, you know what, as much as I can support local, I will support local because we need to try and preserve jobs. And that is not, that's in the hands of the man and woman in the household, right? And we need to look out for each other in that kind of way. If I go to a store and I see Fabuloso on a shelf and I see Green Clean on a shelf, which one will I choose? Mm -hmm. One of them is local, one of them I understand is imported. So just yeah. to put that out there, and that's choices that we can make. Everybody could help in this process, not I just agree. Yeah. Pan. You know, I mean, I think yeah, once upon a time there was the Buy Belize, Build Belize campaign, yeah. which I can remember. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's the messaging that helps us solidify what your role is in being able to, um, to help the country grow. I, but before we, we really run out of time, well, I, I do want to get into some of the, the possible options. And you, you mentioned it briefly there, um, Dion, when you talked about uh, what's happening in Barbados and their boss bonds, as they're called. Um, this is, you know, uh, Prime Minister Motley has been innovative in some of her solutions. What are your thoughts on options like these for or public servants as a way forward? Well, I think it's, again, remember my analogy earlier, I said everything should be on the table, mm -hmm. right? That's one of them that should be on the table. Um, the, the thinking of the government is that that's just increasing the debt. Um, again, there's a trade-off on every end you turn. So, on the one end, you can shave off about three percentage points off of your overall debt to GDP, which, by the way, I have to mention, one of the things that bothers me is that, of course, our debt to GDP will be higher relative to where it was before because the GDP part of it, which is the denominator, has gotten smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to basic maths, if your numerator are roughly the same or a little bit bigger and your denominator comes smaller, of course, the quotient will be larger. Yeah. And that's why it's always been so sad that both the UDP and the PUP politicized this entire crisis. It, we had a drought in 2019, we had COVID in 2020 that has pushed us over and the ledge. We can get into a healthy conversation about resilience yeah. another time because yeah. that is the other half of the coin. But the boss bond type of structure, there is some use to that being on the table. Whether or not you are being for the full 10% or some small fraction, yeah. that is where the negotiation comes in. Yeah. That's where the conversation has to come in. Do we go with the Article 18 of the GATT? We, don't, we run the numbers, we get the Ministry of Finance, we get the Central Bank um, economists on the team, we get our whatever, we run the numbers that we compare and contrast, and we have rational, objective conversation. Yeah. Do we cut salaries? That is obviously on the table. That ought not be taken off the table. That has to be weighed. Not even the APSSM has said that should be off the table. What, but they're all considering we, there's a comprehensive... Yeah. But let me say like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime crisis, so you can't have run-of-the-mill thinking. We need once-in-a-lifetime thinking. thinking. We need once-in-a-lifetime yeah. solutions. Yeah. This is not the time to be running with the business as usual. You guys were putting up a slide just now that I, that I was mm -hmm. quoting from a document from the World Bank. Mm -hmm. The World Bank in that document, if you, I'm just pointing out the document, the Governance COVID-19 Response Managing. You guys, I encourage you to look up that document. Because in there, they see a lot of things about even the standard menu is basically useless right now. Yeah. This has never yeah. happened to us before. There is no economic model that has been able to explain what's happening here. People no historical there. data that there can be none. relied on. There is, and there is none. Un ultimately, there are no easy decisions in how we There's move none. forward. Um, and yeah. I think that's one that we all have to come to terms with. But let's, and you mentioned the APSSM, which is something that I, I also wanted to touch on. What we've heard from different union leaders, the message changes a bit. Some are saying definitively no salary cuts. Some are saying 
Well, you know, it's dependent on, on, on the good governance measures that we see. We cannot lose sight of at least the principle of where this particular industrial action period started. It was not just about looking at salaries. It was about the fact that there is a mistrust in our government systems that it, you know, is long before this particular administration and the fact that the unions are saying, as they did in 2016, we must make a stand now to see the type of structure put in place that we can circumvent some of the things that we usually see take place. The chamber has been a very active voice and in fact a member of the rollout of UNCAT since it was signed in 2016. What are your thoughts on the principled portion of the stance that the unions are making? I will refer you back to our letter, but I see Marcelo is going there. Go ahead, Marcelo. Yeah, no, it, it, the principle of it is uh, something that we as a chamber support because at the end of the day, good governance is important in any society. And it also creates a certain level of predictability. Um, it also allows us to ensure that we safeguard the assets for uh, the people because at the end of the day, the assets aren't for any one administration, it is for the people on a whole. And if we don't safeguard them, then what would be left for our children? Mm -hmm. point. And, and again, I mean, we have been on record calling for, for years, some, several of these measures in partnership with the unions. Yeah. Um, if you look at the Chairman Manifesto, for example, we have a whole section on anti-corruption. Yeah. Our letter, we, we even referred back to the cost saving measures, because if you Maybe I should quote quickly from the letter. We listed some of these things in our letter from the February letter I'm referring to, and we said actually that these things should precede, um, should actually precede the conversation on, on, on the cuts or any other measures that yeah. exist. Right? It says, aside from the wage bill, there are other measures that we believe should precede, precede any cut and would yield far greater returns to the government's fiscal position. So earlier I was talking about one measure that can, you know, create new revenue and slow down the import demand and the balance payments issue. But then there's this long-standing issue of tax evasion that the Chamber of Commerce, and I, we should say here, has been on the record saying that needs to be addressed for donkey's years. So sometimes I have to say the broad brush that comes against us in the private sector, oh, the private sector needs to do their part. We need to start being a little bit more surgical with those comments because... We have a code of ethics for our members that we expect certain things of chamber members. Yeah. But the chamber, there are over 10,000 businesses in this country. The chamber doesn't represent all of them. So I'll leave it at that. And so we on our end have been saying this matter is a problem and we need it fixed in various ways and various forums. We have been calling for this. And so we are, we are agreeing with the principal position. We are only saying no that this is this breakdown is the worst thing you can think about doing to an economy that is already you know, like a dropping of a hole by I talk in Crayola, I practice it lately. A dropping of a hole <laughs> You know the United House, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're, dropping, you're dropping of a hole by, by fourteen feet. Uh -huh. And right now I am if you tell you a problem might creep up by two feet. But then some of the actions they're doing is going to gonna question even that two feet climb out. Wow. Right? That is and again keeping people unemployed longer keeping hungry bellies hungry longer. Mm -hmm. This is, there's a macroeconomic picture that we have to consider and all stakeholders, whether it's government, whether it's unions, whether it's the private sector, the average Joe and Jane, we all have a role to play in this. Mm -hmm. wow. And what about, you know, you're heading into your AGM um, tomorrow, actually, right? And you are going to be having the keynote address from the prime minister. Looking at the past year, how have your members um, fared off? Have you seen business closures? What's, what's the assessment that Chamber has made at this point? Um, definitely there's been closures. Um, uh, businesses have had to make the difficult decision of um, not only releasing staff, but even cutting wages as well uh, to be able to maintain um, business at least afloat. Yeah. Um, and some have actually resorted to some level of borrowing to at least be able to keep the lights on but that can only be sustained in a very short, uh, over a short span of time. Um, and I guess that's the reason, well not guess, but I know that's the reason why we have seen some closures. It's unfortunate because with those closures means that we're adding to the unemployment, uh, apart from that coming from tourism very early. Yeah. And so the question is, so how do we then support those persons from the government standpoint to be able to one, get back into gainful employment, and if not, 
would there be any kind of stimulus packages to assist them, yeah. um, both from a survival standpoint and from uh, securing new employment? Yeah. Yeah. And hence the reason I said earlier, there, there's a conversation on one side about cutting, but there's not a lot being said on the, the opposite side of how we generate new business, new revenue, and putting people back into employment so that we can get out of this uh, position on a, on a faster, at a faster rate than is being projected uh, by the IMF with this 2%. Marlene and John, I know I'm the guest, but can I ask a question to you guys? Uh, I'll decide <laughs> if I'll answer. <laughs> clever, uh, clever answer, Marlene. But here's a, here, Marcella said something about new business ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So your, your cruise tourism industry basically goes unconscious. You look at countries like Germany and, and, and whatnot, and you, you find things like virtual tourism being done aggressively to try and make up that shortfall. From you guys in the media, have you seen anybody in Belize moving that direction from the stories we've been covering? Isn't that an innovative thing that we should be considering? I think we've heard of it. Um, I have heard of uh, virtual tourism, uh, but it's definitely uh, something that uh, we're, uh, people have been skeptical about because we don't necessarily know at this particular point how to move it forward. And that's where you get your experts in the room. You have people with brilliant ideas. Yeah. I've had conversations with people in the sector. And I, I didn't just pose that without having talked to people. Yeah. Yeah. There are people in the sector that has not only thought of this idea, but have actually promulgated it. Yeah. And it seems to be falling on a majority of mass deaf ears. And that's just one example. And that's just one. I mean, yeah. you get a bunch of business people in a room and you start coming up with other ideas that can be adjusted for this new normal. Yeah. That will gain you foreign exchange. You go check out what essenceofberlin.com is doing. I mean, these guys have tours that they're offering for 79 euros per tour. The museums have put, have put their art on display as well. You they, can, yeah. you can uh, check out uh, world-famous artwork online for a fee as well. There you but, go. So that's, you know, that's the, bringing the in some money. Here, the challenge here, and, and I'm not posing a problem, I think one of the things that happens is, and we've heard it so much, there needs to be an innovative approach to how we're going to get out of this. But when the burden is so heavy, perhaps it's because you know the government themselves, they know what they're facing in their individual ministries. Should there be, um, whether it, it's, it's a bipartisan and, and including stakeholders, just a, a group of people who will come together, not just government representatives, who will help to hammer out some details as to how we move forward out of where we are today. So we're waiting on a report from the Economic Recovery Advisory Team. So I, I believe that was this government's version of that, what you just described. Yeah, but it is also a small, it's a small group and, and not as representative as many would want it to be. Yeah, I, I, I personally could agree with that. But, and, and again, you can note that the Chamber did not have official representation as an organization on that committee. Mm -hmm. This is a point that we have raised and voiced directly to the government, but we're, we're, we're giving time to the, the new government to, 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 to get into its role and do what it has to do. But I agree with you, Marlene, that there's definitely, this is, this is one of those times where all the king's men, all the king's forces need to have been called in. All right? That's what that little nursery rhyme was trying to teach <laughs> yeah, us for a time yeah. like this. <laughs> right? well. so, so this is not even the time for the politicking that we've been seeing. We need to get everybody on board. And lastly, and, just and lastly, as we quickly run out of time, um, has, has the chamber discussed the idea of subscribing to the IMF program? If you'd make that recommendation. You mean the standby arrangement? Yes. No, we have not. That, um, not to my knowledge. Um, Marcelo is in the EC. Maybe that's been discussed there. But no, that has been a, a consideration. And I, I personally, I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. There are so many other options to be considered that need to be considered first before we subscribe to the standby arrangement. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, guys, thank you so very much for uh, breaking it down for us. And we do hope that uh, these negotiations actually get back to the table being mediated by the BCCI. Thank you, and do enjoy your day, both of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're about to take a break. When we come back, we'll be discussing um, vaccination week in the Americas. We're actually at day three. We'll talk about that when we come back. Stay with us.